zkusit tady. Takže máš to nejvíc kůl na letku, kterou jsem nikdy nemohl sehnat. Kterou? Nevím, já jsem ráno šel kolem stánku, ona tam ležela, tak jsem si písal. <laughs> One other thing, there's one other open shift time when you can ask questions of the open shift team. Today at 15.40 in room uh, D207, uh, the title of the thing is, so you want to be a developer, advocate, or evangelist? All of the open shift evangelists and advocates will be on the stage, and it's sort of a ask me anything session. And you want to turn this screen on? Uh, it's, yeah. So that's at 3.40 and D207. So if you don't get your questions answered there, everybody yep. from our team Okay. Is John. some slides for today. Um, trying to get them to display correctly, but this screen resolution is very, quite small. Uh, let's see if I can fix this uh, really quickly. What do I have here? Ah. Okay, no, not far to go. Yeah. Okay, close this. Full screen and reload. This is what happens when you have a high DPI display and you plug into a low resolution monitor. Your uh, browser tab takes up the top fifth of the screen. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I have uh, some slides for you guys. Uh, we'll be covering Docker, Kubernetes, and OpenShift 3. Um, how many have you uh, have used OpenShift before? Almost every, a lot of people. How, uh, let me ask the other way. How many have not used OpenShift? Oh, even more people. Okay, all right. <laughs> well, welcome to the class. We'll, we'll uh, show you the new version of OpenShift. Um, this is uh, hopefully a deeper look into the, the system. Um, and I, I tried creating a server environment just before. We'll see if, if my environment's up. Um, this link here, if you have a laptop, I would encourage you to go to this link. Um, you'll need this information as we go through uh, the workshop. And let's see, I have, uh, what, how much time? Hour and 20 minutes, about? Anyone know? I will tell you. Um, just let me check out. And do yeah, it. yeah. I think hour and a half or something. Like <coughs> hour and a half. Okay. We might we might need all the time. Uh, we'll see. Um, 
Also, I was hoping to download uh, binary files for you to use. Uh, I got these blank USBs and they're all read only, so I wasn't able to burn these. I have a copy on my laptop. I might need to make one copy and have you uh, make more copies, pass them on back uh, as we go. Uh, so let's see if I can get started. I'm going to copy one out and I may ask the audience for help um, for this part because the Wi-Fi is quite slow. So it's already downloaded here. I don't want you to have to do the same thing. I'll show you where you can get your own copy of uh, these OpenShift uh, command line tool releases. Um, if you go to OpenShift Origin on GitHub, there will be a tab, uh, commits, branches, this off the side of the screen is our uh, releases tab. So in the future, we have just rolled out a 1.1.2 release for our upstream code. Um, this also has a lot of information about API changes, new features that have been introduced in this latest release. There's also some screenshots. Oh, this is uh, Jacob's new, new features that are coming through. Good to see uh, these available. So I have some, uh, let me get these off of my computer and onto at least one USB and uh, people can work on uh, passing them around the class. Stop working. Okay. I need to plug in my One copy ready. Uh oh. <laughs> May have ejected it too soon. Uh, if you already have the CLI tools, uh, you're good. If not, uh, feel free to copy it onto your laptop, pass it on down the line. Hopefully, the. No, I was just checking if it, if it works. It yeah, yeah. It mounted yeah. correctly. So, whoever wants that. Okay, there should be, mm, hopefully these, these work. Pass it on down if you already have. Okay, we can get started. Uh, I just want to get a couple of these circulating and then uh, I'll continue with the slides. Sorry for the late late start here I, I see uh, workshops, virtual books, and OWA file there. Yeah. So but not. Uh, do you have any? Not empty, these new ones. Do you have any ah, okay. empty, empty drive? I will try to copy. Copy. copy from my machine. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully, we could do some of this with a web-based interface as well. Sorry, are you talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, go to the releases page. Go ahead and do the download yourself. Um, I'm just, for people who are blocked with the Wi-Fi, I want a couple copies going around. Okay, we'll get back to these slides. 
Uh, and hopefully Jorge can help you out. If, uh, if you do need a copy of the CLI tools, um, Jorge's here to help. Uh, he's in the back corner there. Raise your hand, let us know. We'll be happy to help. Okay, so we get to these slides. Uh, Here we go, now I'm at the level. Okay. okay. Only ten minutes late. All right. So here we go. I'm uh, a very sweaty Ryan Jarvman. Sorry for the delay, uh, we'll get started here. I work with uh, Red Hat's OpenShift team as a, uh, as a developer evangelist. And I stayed out way too late last night. <laughs> so apologies. Uh, so uh, let's go. Let's, uh, here's a quick agenda of some things that we'll cover today. Uh, we'll do workshop setup. Hopefully you could do the download yourself uh, or Get a copy of one of these discs that are uh, being passed around, if, if they work. Um, we'll cover a brief amount about containerizing your existing applications using Docker. How to go from uh, no container to uh, experimenting with containers. Uh, we'll talk about building and shipping your Docker images using OpenShift v3. And we'll talk a little bit about replication and healing using Kubernetes. Um, how many people have heard of Kubernetes? Almost everyone, okay. And, and uh, does someone want to tell me, it, how, do you know some background about Kubernetes? Where it's from, who's, who's designing it, what it's based on, any volunteers? Yeah. It's a Google project, right, and it's coming out of the Borg thing. Borg, yes, exactly. And, and uh, so... It's actually the, alien. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, and like on Star Trek, the, uh, the robots that uh, assimilate everything, right? Uh, so the idea with Borg is you need um, massive uh, tools and automation for doing containers at a google size scale. Um, not everyone knows this, but Google internally, uh, everything they do, um, except maybe some Android, um, everything from Google Search, Gmail, Google Apps, Docs, uh, everything at Google runs inside containers. It's not Docker containers internally. Um, Docker containers are a little fatter uh, than what's available inside Google. Uh, they need very high density per machine. Um, so they're not currently using Google, but Borg is the uh, management practices that they have developed to do um, massive scale container management. And so Kubernetes is the uh, open source equivalent to the Borg tool set, um, but adapted to use Docker containers. So um, it gets you in the mindset of managing containers the same way a large, large scale company like Google uh, would do. Uh, finally, uh, we'll talk about composing applications using templates. This will allow us to uh, lay out a topology of multiple images, stitch them together, uh, inject configuration, and uh, usually in my release pipeline, I have maybe a slightly different template per stage, right? My development stage may have a slightly different topography than my uh, CI environment. And my production environment, of course, is going to have my big production database. Uh, but for staging and testing, I may not want to give anyone access to prod, right? You want to isolate the production environment, uh, test with uh, data that's uh, less risky, right? Uh, so templates is a good way to encapsulate exactly what architecture you would like to deploy uh, using these images. Uh, so for the workshop setup, uh, you'll want the OC command line tool. Uh, there should be, hopefully, uh, a couple USBs. I anyone not have the OC command line tool yet? Okay, here's, here's where you get it. GitHub.com, OpenShift origin releases. There should be a binary uh, for each language, or each... Uh, Wi-Fi is too slow. 
If you have a really slow Wi-Fi, raise your hand, let Jorge know. No? No good on the USB? Do you have a USB, Jorge? You can't write to it? You have another USB. Any volunteers with a USB? All we need is the power supply, right? The one of four towers. Here's what you need. I'll show you. Uh, I, I know this is an a open source community. You can, you can solve this problem, uh, I am confident. Uh, so let me show you how you can do it. Uh, go to OpenShift Origin. Look for the Releases tab. Yeah, the download, if the download is very slow for you, one thing you could try is disconnect from the Wi-Fi and reconnect. You might end up on a faster connection, you might not. Um, but uh, that, that trick sometimes works. There are client tools for 32-bit Linux, 64-bit Linux, Apple, Windows, and you don't need this server one for today. You probably just need 64-bit uh, Linux, right? I anyone not using this? Who's, who's using Apple? Oh, you're okay. You're all right. I'm you, okay. <laughs> anyway, here's all your selections. Pick the one appropriate for you. Um, and if, if anyone does have a USB, yeah, which OS on that? I think it... Oh, is it empty? It can be. Okay. You can just, just format it. Okay, I'll I'll uh, I'll give this a try, and um, <coughs> hopefully we'll have at least one going around. Let's see. I seem to have a fast connection, so. I'll yeah. Be... Okay. Here, I'll I'll pass this. Uh, who said they have a fast connection? Yeah. Okay. You would like to put uh, binaries there. Uh, how many people not on, on Linux? It's Apple, and do you already have the command line? Yeah. You already have it. Okay, you don't matter. So not, not really, but uh, anyone still need the binary and need something other than uh, Linux? Just 64-bit Linux. That's all we need. Okay. So hopefully we'll get the, the tools out to you soon, or you could try downloading. If I could find, okay. So here's where you get the command line tool. Next step, uh, let's go try to log in. Uh, we have a different server name for today. I believe, uh, let's see if this one works. We do. Okay, so the server name for today. Pen. Whiteboard. DevConf CZ. You need HTTPS. OpenShift master devconf cz openshift3 roadshow.com is where we'll be working. Uh, and uh, everyone needs user accounts here. So this is something you'll need to remember uh, throughout the course. So uh, first row here. We'll start with zero, all right? You guys are row zero. Next one, row one. Row two. Three, four, let's see, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And uh, let's go uh, users. Uh, so if, if you're row one, uh, or let's see, you'll be zero, one, mm -hmm. zero, two, right? Got it? Which number are you? One, one. One, two. How about you? What, what user number? Two, two, one. Oh, no laptop. Okay. You can also try with your cell phone. Right? Okay. So pick a, pick a user number. You're, I'll be user zero, zero. Okay? 
And uh, is everyone able to reach this web page here? Yeah, here. Open, is this readable? No, not quite? Okay. Here, let's go through up here. Open Shift Master, DevConf. Good update my slides. I'm going to write it in big here. Yeah, yeah, please. Thank you. Does anybody need the clients too? This is that the here. I'll, that's the back here. That's his. Yeah. There it is. Thank you. Yeah, he cut me off while I was downloading it. It's coming fast, and then he said, "Nope." Ah. Huh. Ah, we do a short a short URL. Well, usually I'd have this in my slides. I think you missed the CZ. 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. And uh, hopefully you have a user number. I'm going to try mine here. User zero zero. Okay. Well, Password. The dot after free might be <clears throat> might be confusing. Nope. There's, uh, there's, no, there. there's no dot here. Okay. There's no dot. Okay, and the password. What is three people missing from your Antonio? How many? Um, this is low. Okay. Where's the three? Is there open shift? Yeah. Where's the three? This is the password. Do you know the guy? Okay. And anyone have it working? Does anyone manage to sign in? Good job. All right. All right. Cool. Good to know. All right. When you sign in, you should see something like this. It's a list of all your projects. Oh, wait a minute here. Uh, talk about the projects. These projects, you can use these uh, in a variety of ways. Some people might use a project as a bucket for a, a single application with multiple microservices. Some people use these as a way to um, carve out uh, different groups. Let's see, you, you could have your QA team has one project and the uh, production environment maybe is in another project. That's another way to slice this up. Uh, it all depends on how you would like to organize uh, your applications, what makes the most sense for um, how you deploy and what you deploy. Uh, but it's a very flexible environment. And OpenShift, one of the things OpenShift adds uh, beyond what's included in the basic Kubernetes system is uh, this support for projects and role-based access control. So along these projects, uh, the scope of each project, you can say uh, certain users have access to project A, but not to project B. Or certain users are an, an administrator, but only for certain project names, right? So I can be maybe an admin. Right now, I'm, I'm not an admin in any projects. But the administrator could give me admin privileges of just my project. And then I can play around with some of the admin uh, tooling with a uh, limited amount of damage to the rest of the environment, right? Any questions about projects, about permission scopes? I don't cover a lot about permissions, but this is where you would uh, set permission scopes is relative to projects. So I'll open up, uh, how many people have logged in now? A better number, and, and how many people are never going to log in? Okay, all right, I'll, I'll keep it moving. Let me know if I'm going too fast, uh, but I don't want to delay too long. We'll get to this content. Uh, so I'll open up. Uh, here's a basic uh, application that should be pre-deployed for each of you. Uh, how many people have heard of a smoke test? Smoke test, are you familiar with this term? When I was uh, traveling, I've done this. Uh, this is a term in uh, maybe more popular in the United States. 
the idea is uh, you, you plug it into the wall, and if it doesn't start smoking, if it doesn't burst into flames, then that, that's the basic test of, uh, it's, uh, at least it's not on fire, right? That's a, that's a very minimal test. So we've deployed a very minimal application to test the environment. You should all have a smoke test pre-deployed and a project pre-created. Um, so here's uh, what the OpenShift uh, web console will look like once you've logged in. Uh, there's a variety of things you can do here. You have this uh, project drop-down list, so you could switch to different project views. You can also filter the content based on various labels. These labels are uh, something built into Kubernetes. Um, you can see an overview of all the different um, microservices or uh, systems that are running, with, uh, applications, whatever you call them, running within your system. Uh, you can browse for more specific uh, types here. Like I can look at my builds, my deployments, events, image streams, pods. Some of these terms are native to Kubernetes. And some of these terms are specific to OpenShift. They're extensions to the base uh, set of terms available uh, or objects available in Kubernetes. So a pod is something from Kubernetes. Anyone know what a pod is? Uh, you? Yeah? Uh, a set of uh, containers. Uh-huh. Yeah. Any, anything specific about this set, uh, where they run or, or how they're managed? Yeah, yeah, physically co-located on the same machine. Um, and if one of the two uh, or, or three in this pod group fails, they all fail together, all right? And when they scale, they all scale together, all right? This is kind of your minimum increment of scale. Yes, question? How can I scale across machines then? So uh, with Kubernetes, uh, there's no clear way, uh, well, there's a couple advanced ways to guarantee that pods land on separate machines, um, but usually you create pods and you let the platform decide which machine is the best machine, and it's up to the, the system uh, to kind of place these uh, workloads. You can have um, in your deployment configuration you can have uh, something called a node selector, where you say, uh, this particular type of pod, it's a database. I need this to always land on my big hardware with lots of memory in the fast disk. So you could use a node selector to help place these in specific uh, locations or regions or districts, depending on how uh, your network is organized. And about that's the most atomic uh, kind of unit can uh, scale across machines, right? This, yeah, when, when you scale up, you, you make uh, additional copies of the pod, and uh, these pods will be put behind a load balancer. Right. We can get uh, a quick look at, um, here's, a, here's a topology view here. Um, so there's a couple pieces that we have. Um, one of these pieces here, this is called a route. And if you click on the route, you should see more information in the right-hand uh, column here. It says it's a, it's a route type. Here's the name of the route. Um, and a route is basically a uh, public host name for a service. A service is a load balancer for a group of one or more pods. Um, this is... I believe a, it's highlighted weird, but this is a replication controller. This controls how many pods are uh, in circulation across the cluster. Um, let me click on this replication controller and we could see some more information. Currently we have one replica, right? Um, and then the last, the final object here, this is the deployment configuration. So this tells how the replication controller should manage the pods. And each time we do a new deployment, we create one replication controller per deployment. Right. Makes sense? Yeah, it makes total sense. And the, but where can I see like 
Docker instances within that pod? Can, like, yeah, it? yeah. Let's click on the pod. And coming from the Docker side, I guess most. Let's click on the pod, okay. and here we have container statuses. Mm -hmm. We should be able to see how many containers are included in this pod, and we should be able to see how many times it's been restarted. And also, uh, let's see, there's other, you could see which images the container is based on. And you could see if in, uh, configuration has been injected okay. into these container environments. Cool. You could also, if you want a persistent disk, you can attach volumes. Because these container environments are meant to be stateless, easily destroyed, easily scaled, easily recreated. And so if you want persistent disk, you need to add it. Okay, but that's, all, that's really nice because it's all Docker concepts, right? All, to, all pure Docker. Docker concepts, Kubernetes concepts, and uh, the extended types that we have, the deployment config, we're actually adding as a new uh, object type in Kubernetes. It's an experimental object type. Um, after the Google team took a look at our deployment config, they said, wow, this is actually really great stuff. We'd like to merge this upstream. So when it becomes an upstream feature, Red Hat's very, very actively contributing on Kubernetes. I think we have the, the second leading contributor and, and we're the second largest uh, contributor as far as companies go. Um, so very active on, on the upstream of Kubernetes, very active on the upstream of Docker. It's not just our open source, it's the community's open source, right? Um, so the, the deployment config is, a, is becoming an upstream feature. I'm not sure if it will be called deployment config after it's merged into Google's code. It may get a name change, I'm not sure. It depends on, uh, yes? Just deployment. Just deployment? Ah, okay, yeah. That's the current name, Just Deployment. Just Deployment. So we may need to do a small rebase yeah, but around, but... Uh, essentially it's the same. Yeah, essentially the same feature. And uh, who knows this feature best? The Red Hat team, yeah, right? Red Hat. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'm going to go back to the overview and we'll uh, scale up this environment. Uh, Please don't scale it up to uh, 5,000 or, uh, you know, try, go ahead and try two or three. And you should be able to see uh, our, our requested allocation and then it should be fulfilled, hopefully. Uh, we've had a couple uh, stability issues with this environment, but, uh, aha, oh, okay, we're up to our three containers. Hopefully you all have as uh, uh, success with this demo. Let me know if you have problems. We're uh, eager to collect your feedback, uh, and if you would like to pay us, we're eager to collect your, your money as well with OpenShift Enterprise. Uh, we, ha of course, have the upstream code available, but we, you can get support from Red Hat, from the team who's working on the core uh, concepts. So now, uh, it's hard to see on this screen. Uh, here we, ooh. Let's see if I could change the zoom here. Now you can see we have, uh, three pods managed by the replication controller. If I click on the replication controller, you'll now see the requested replica count is three. We have three available. Um, and the, uh, this is called a service. This is in Kubernetes terms. It's basically a software load balancer that will distribute the load across these pods. Uh, Within OpenShift, we provide a, a flat uh, network map um, across all of these pods. Uh, if I click on one of these, actually, I'm going to go to a different view here. Uh, this is not quite what I wanted. Let's see. If I click on one of these pods, I should be able to see here that there's a particular IP address on the node, um, an internal IP address. This is a 10.4 here for this particular pod. And if I go check the pod next to it, this one is on a 10.9. This probably means it's on a separate node. All right, it got placed randomly across our cluster of 10 machines. And you could kind of tell between these that, that uh, here's a 10.5. Um, so they each get internal IP addresses. 
The pods can communicate directly IP to IP, but it's more preferable um, since you don't know if these IPs will stay. If a pod is uh, removed or re rescheduled somewhere else, the best way to communicate with this group of pods is via the service or the load balancer. Let's see where I'm at in my, my slides here. Uh, now that we've seen a little bit about the OpenShift web console, um, anyone still working on logging in or getting the command line tools? You need help? Oh, okay. Well, you, at least you know where to go yeah. and which user number. You're uh, 32? 2 2? Sure, 2 2. All right. Okay. Yeah, uh, you can use the command line tools. I'm using yeah. Git and it works. <laughs> okay, good, good. Okay. So, uh, good to know you're all ready to continue. Um, I'll, we'll ta talk really quickly about how to dockerize uh, an existing application. If you have an app, uh, a source repository today, um, you could add a Docker file. Uh, how many people have experience? Uh, how many people have never used a Docker file? Only a few people. Okay, good. I mean, so, so Docker file. I'll take a look at a, an example uh, really quickly. So this. Uh, let's see. I wonder if I have a. Might be easier to read, yeah, slightly. Um, so here, the Docker file starts with a line that says from Fedora 21. That's the base operating system. Um, I have a maintainer line. And you can see in here, I'm doing a uh, yum install, right? Is there uh, anything uh, that, can anyone point out, a, a, I guess, is there any potential issues with uh, I don't know how to ask this correctly. Uh, let me, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just tell you that uh, one of the issues with doing a Docker build is that there is this either a yum install or an apt get install as part of the build process. In order to carry out this command, what do you need? You, you need root, right? That means if you are running builds for other people, you're handing out root permission during the life cycle of this build. And that, that may be a risky move. Uh, for OpenShift, we have a hosted version of our service called OpenShift Online, where we say, hey, internet, anyone with an email address, come at me. Bring, bring your worst, right? And so we have uh, trolls, we have hackers, we have uh, fraud. We have all kinds of people coming in and trying to take over our machines. And for that reason, when we run image builds on OpenShift Online, we probably will not have the Docker build, uh, build strategy enabled on our system. You can build straight from Docker files on your own outside of the system and then push your resulting image into OpenShift. Uh, that will work. You could also use OpenShift to, to build using the Docker files if it's something where you are managing OpenShift. But when Red Hat manages uh, a public OpenShift environment, this might be a, a build strategy that we disable for security reasons, right? And if you're working in a high security environment, you know, it depends on how much you trust your developers. Do you trust every developer with root? Maybe, maybe, maybe not, right? Maybe it's just the operators who do this type of work. So along those lines, we actually, uh, we do builds of the uh, uh, base images by the operations team. And then uh, since Docker is a layered file system that you can commit new layers and then do a diff in order to see what's changed, um, we can add on the application code on top of a known good base. And that's how we do uh, something we call source to image. So we'll show a source to image build next. Uh, if you're doing, how many people use uh, JavaScript? 
couple people. All right, I'm I'm uh, I'm wearing my Node Node Interactive shirt here. Uh, I do a lot of JavaScript programming. Uh, this is a tool that I wrote for helping auto configure your JavaScript application to work in OpenShift v2, OpenShift v3, Heroku, um, uh, Modulus is a, a open uh, Node.js hosting. Basically, this uh, gives you vendor neutral uh, configuration strings to help configure your application. If we get a chance to look at some of the source code later, I'll show you how I use this. Uh, but inside the container, this is one of the tools I use for auto configuring my application. Um, we talked about adding a Docker file to your existing repo. Uh, that's one way to get started. Also, if, if yes? Uh, there is something similar for Python Django or something, or some Python language, Python library language. Where you, I, I would love to hear, there might be, I'm not sure. The main thing that you need to know for V3 and for Docker, if you're really just targeting Docker, uh, the main thing you want to do is expose your web service on port 8080. Uh, and also when you bind uh, to an IP address, um, you want to bind to 0 .0 .0 0.0.0.0 and then regardless of which IP we assign, it, it'll work. So really this is uh, uh, 8080. 80. This is really the result of any time I do that auto configuration in a Docker enabled environment. This is what my, so for Python you could shorten it just down to this if you, if you wanted to. It wouldn't maybe, eh, this might work on Heroku as well or, or other platforms. Um, but it, someone should, if it doesn't exist for Python already, maybe someone should make an auto configuration uh, library. Uh, another way to automate your builds and to kind of outsource that risk of uh, handing out root permission, you could automate your builds on Docker Hub. If you have a Docker file in your repo on GitHub, you can uh, do an integration between GitHub and Docker Hub. And then anytime you push to GitHub, they'll notify Docker Hub. Docker Hub will run your build and host a copy of the resulting uh, container image. Um, this is uh, pretty good for a, a free, free solution, but my builds take about half an hour here. Uh, it's not quite fast enough for uh, rapidly iterate on, on code. In OpenShift, my builds usually take a minute or less. So let's look at uh, building and shipping on OpenShift. Um, here's one uh, repository that you can, if, if you're going to follow along and uh, do a full build and deploy, uh, this is a repository that you can uh, fork on GitHub. Uh, you can also just deploy this directly. Uh, this is really just, it's not even a good, if you want a good repository, I've got, I've got better ones. Uh, here's, uh, but this is just a very basic repo that I forked from one of my uh, coworkers. Uh, slow network here. Uh, some of our UI really relies on WebSockets in order to update the, the, the web console. So when the network is slow, it, it may seem uh, not quite as responsive as, as what you would see on a better network. So here's this uh, smoke test application. This should be what you have deployed already. It's really just an index.php file um, with, I think, some text inside of it. It doesn't really re execute any code or interpret any code. Um, it's very simple. Um, so not really worth writing down, but uh, yeah, feel free to, to try it out. You could also, the slides will be available long term, whether it's on a website, so uh, which I'm hosting in a Docker container. <laughs> uh, so you can fork this project uh, as one way to get started. Um, if you want to do Node.js, um, I would suggest um, RyanJ slash HTTP base. This is the one that I will be using, HTTP base.
Okay, github.com Ryan J HTTP base. So if you hit fork on this project, um, you'll be able to configure uh, an automatic deploy anytime you push to this repo. So let's take a, let's take a look at source to image. <coughs> I'm going to use the add to project button that should be in the top right hand corner. And just in case this is, well, uh, let's see, let's see about this network. Aha, okay, finally loaded. Uh, this looks kind of crummy because I have such a high DPI monitor and uh, as you can see from the browser tabs up top, uh, Usually these, these icons are a little bigger, this looks a little nicer. Uh, so hopefully if you have your laptop open, you should be able to confirm this, this is actually a very nice UI. Uh, so I'm gonna find my uh, Node.js base image. This has already had the yum install already done. All the, the risk of uh, handing out root permission has been handed out to my operations team who's already built a standard base. This allows them to have, uh, throughout the entire workshop, they can make sure everyone is using the, the right OS, the correct dependencies, everyone is, is patched up. We don't have a shell shock or heart bleed or any of these major uh, low level exploits at wild within our uh, network. Did you have a question? No. No? Okay. So I'll use Node.js. I'm going to copy this uh, HTTP base repository. I'm going to name the service dub 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 since it's a web service. I could just hit create here. It's really that simple. You, you tell us what source code you want. We build an image and hand you back a host URL. Really simple, right? You, you can't can't really get much more simple than that. Uh, but let's look at the advanced options. Uh, if I wanted to start users on a particular branch, uh, let's say I was developing a new feature, I could start them on a, a particular feature branch or tag. Or if I wanted to deploy master from last week, I could look up the commit checksum and put in the commit hash here, right? Then I could build that particular uh, commit and deploy that. Um, I can also, here is uh, routing. Do I want to expose a route? These routes work kind of like um, Apache virtual hosts. We look at the, the host header of the incoming traffic, and then based on the host header that's incoming, we'll assign the traffic to a particular service, and the service will pass it on to the pods, right? Um, if I wanted to have a specific host name um, that, that I knew, I um, I've already pointed the IP address or the DNS to go into my cluster. Um, I can sniff for that host name and make sure it gets passed on to my service uh, and then to my pods. So if this was a back-end service, a database, I would, uh, I would make sure that this box is not selected. We only want to expose our front-end services, uh, our front-end web services. And uh, we'll leave our protected services without a route, so it can only be contacted internally. Yeah? And if you deploy the database, you would attach persistent storage to that? Exactly. Thing? Yeah, yeah. So would you do that here? Uh, that no, no. This is for builds. Okay. And we wouldn't be running a build with a database. We'd be deploying a pre-existing image. Okay. Yeah. So the Ruffle service is provided by OpenShift? This build service? Yes, yes, it's it's built into it's built into Kubernetes. Okay. There was a uh, previous uh, service uh, they called this load balancer a service. I, I don't like the term because that's also what I call my web services. So I'm not too happy about the the terminology, but um, the Red Hat team took a look at the uh, service code in Kubernetes 
and uh, figured there's some improvements we can make, and so we replaced it with a HA proxy based load balancer. So the, the service um, is a HA proxy instance that's running within <coughs> Kubernetes. It's, it is included by default in Kubernetes. Uh, I think these routes are, uh, we'll see whether this was a, a Red Hat contribution. I have a list which ones were Red Hat, which ones were Google. Uh, we'll see that in a minute. Um, build configuration. So I want to automatically rebuild whenever my code changes on GitHub, right? Wouldn't that be slick? As soon as I push, let's rebuild a Docker image and deploy it right away, right? Also, anytime the operations team makes an update to our base image, let's say they find out there's a new exploit, Heartbleed, Shellshock, one of these things, we want to patch our whole cluster, all they have to do is push an update to the base image, and if I have this box selected, it'll rebuild my application container that has the base image as a dependency, right? Really slick, really slick. Dual, dual trigger mechanism for, for rebuilding, either from the dev team or the ops team. Either one can trigger a rebuild. And for my dev environment, I don't mind if the ops team rebuilds my, my containers. No problem. For, for a CI environment, same is true. Um, also, since uh, these images are stateless, anytime we push new config into the image, usually we do that via a redeploy. It's probably the same image. We're not rebuilding, but we're uh, repushing. Um, oh, actually, this is, yeah, this is build configuration. We can put in specific keys just for the build here. And we can also have in our deployment configuration, we can say auto deploy in certain conditions. So I leave this auto, this is my, uh, uh, from a DevOps perspective, this is my continuous delivery checkbox, right? <laughs> Check this box, continuous delivery, done, right? At least for my dev stage, right? Um, once I have an image built, then it's simply a matter of promoting that image across each of the remaining stages in my deployment pipeline. Um, I'd probably leave this unchecked in production, right? The production maybe is only the release team that does that final promotion of the image. Uh, but for every other stage, usually I auto-promote or auto-deploy. We could also say if this was a high availability service, we may want a minimum of three right from the start. We can, we can uh, add that into our config there. I'll hit create. We'll get this one started. Here's our new service. The build is running. We can take a look at the build log and see how, uh, how well our network is holding up. Usually this uh, page will stream in the results as the build happens. <laughs> Let's see how, uh, how streamy this, this is. It's not that bad. Hey, it's, it's moving. That's better than, uh, oh, good, good, all right. Better than not moving. <laughs> better than not moving, yeah. So we can watch the build as it happens. Uh, when this is done, we'll see that it'll start pushing the resulting image into our internal Docker registry. OpenShift has a uh, integrated Docker registry. Um, and it uh, should get there pretty soon. I'm not sure if, uh, if the build has finished and I don't have the next message or if, uh, oh, here we go. We got some more messages, a lot more messages. If we had errors during the build process, these build logs are kept uh, for a short amount of time that's configurable by the uh, management team. They could say keep the last three builds or the last 10. Uh, depends on how aggressive you want to be about garbage collection. Um, let's follow. Usually this finishes in uh, generally under a minute uh, is, is my experience with Node.js. Um, other, other language types, it may vary. Um, for Java users, we have something called binary deploys. So if you're already building WAR files or EAR files, 
Uh, you can use binary deploys to ship your uh, resulting uh, jar Java environment, um, and we'll wrap that in a Docker container. Um, if you're doing a full Maven build on our system, that'll be a little bit slower, but we can also do a full Maven build, so you can do just a standard git push uh, to GitHub. GitHub will fire off an event, back to op OpenShift, trigger a new build, and a new deploy. The webhook, yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll show the webhook next. Okay, so I'm going to go back to my... Ah, says the build is completed. Let's go back here, and uh, we should be able to catch the uh, deploy happening here. Here's our host name that's been added, or our, our route, right? Uh, so if I click on this right now, I'll see an error message because there aren't any pods available to service the request. My request is going uh, into the cluster on this URL. Um, it's hitting the, uh, the routing layer that's then passing it on to my service. The service is trying to contact the pods, but there's no pods yet. And so it should, oh, I was expecting a 503 error, but um, the network's so slow that it was able to deploy the pod before the request went through. So. <laughs> Here's my resulting application that's been built and deployed, uh, built into a Docker image from our source using the standard base from our operations team. <coughs> and then I can go in and scale this up right away. Hit the up arrow, the down arrow, scale this up and down. Take these guys down. So here, we're up to two containers for our www service. And I should be able to see all this on our topology diagram here. This is our dub dub dub, uh, our route, our service, the pods, the replication controller, and the uh, deployment config. Any questions? All good so far? Okay. We talked about source to image. Okay, so we talked about, there's a couple pieces. These are two particularly interesting pieces. This will be called deployment in the future. I've just recently learned. Mm -hmm. um, the build config is still something really unique to OpenShift. Um, and really what makes, part of what makes OpenShift a much more developer facing uh, project. Uh, Kubernetes is primarily a tool for operations teams who already have images and want to ship those images. Um, but it doesn't give developers a whole lot to do until after the image is already built. Um, and even then, it's, it's really a, more a tool for operators. So I think our web UI and this build config really add a lot to make uh, Kubernetes much more usable for real users. We have some change triggers that we'll see inside the deployment config. Um, We'll redeploy on environment change or on image change. So if a new latest uh, image is available in our internal registry, that will fire something uh, called an image change trigger that will notify our deployment config. And uh, that's, that's one of the hooks the deployment config uses, basically, uh, to trigger those deployment events. Docker build is one of our build strategies. Source to image is much more secure and uh, I think faster and uh, uh, better for a variety of reasons, I think. Uh, webhooks. Next I'll set up a webhook and then we'll do a, a basically a, a make a git change in order to build and ship. So here's my HTTP base repository. Um, I already have a fork of this. If you want to follow along with the webhook example, you will need to fork this repository. Or you could use the uh, smoke one and then use a PHP base image, up to you. Uh, there's also some uh, Python examples available if you, if you prefer Python. I could give you a repo URL for that as well. Uh, but let's take a look at our uh, builds. I'll go here to my www um, service web service and uh, take a look at the build configuration. Here is a generic build trigger. This could be used in 
maybe with Jenkins or even with curl, if I really wanted to trigger a build right from the command line or automate it, I could use this generic one. There's also a GitHub uh, webhook. So I'm going to copy uh, the GitHub webhook and uh, go to the settings area of my fork. All right, you better pay attention for this part. Uh, I should have more slides for this because this is a little tricky. Uh, so if you're following along, uh, go to your fork of the repo and click on settings. Try clicking several times if, if you like. <laughs> um, so in here you can see there's a web service, webhooks and web services section. And give it a second click and see if this can cooperate. I was really counting on the, uh, they promised me a hard line for, for the presenters and it doesn't seem to be working. All right, here's our, here's our webhook. All right, so I will, I'll remove my previous webhook. And I'm going to add a new one. Here we go, add webhook. I'm going to paste in the payload URL. This will link back to my OpenShift master server. Um, one thing to note here, since I generated this environment yesterday, um, oh, and, and you probably already noticed this when you contacted the server, um, we're using a self-signed SSL certificate for this environment. Um, this is because I generated this environment using our Ansible deployment scripts, and I haven't bothered to pay for SSL uh, for this one-day workshop, right? So if you really want the, the SS, SSL certificates, um, I encourage everyone to have real SSL whenever possible, um, but I just generated it myself, um, or the really the automation tools generated it for me. Um, so... Since we've, we have, uh, due to that fact, I'm going to click on this disable SSL. This is one of the steps you'll need. Make sure not to forget this step. Disable SSL. Uh, where did you get the webhook URL again? And, and the, ah, yeah, the yeah. Uh, good question. So I went to browse. Browse, yeah. And then I went to builds. I clicked on the build that I want to automate. And then there should be a configuration tab within that build, and the GitHub webhook should be there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So I think oh, I still need to add webhook. Okay. And the secret. No, just uh, you can leave the secret blank. Um, leave, leave. All you need is the top line, and you need um, disable SSL. Yeah. Otherwise, everything else leave leave with the defaults. Okay. My webhook is created. I should now be able to make a small change uh, to this repo. I'm going to make a change to the index. .html file. And I'm going to edit it so I don't have to git clone and pull down the project onto my laptop. I'm going to use this edit the file right on GitHub. Right? This will make it very easy to uh, commit a change, trigger our uh, deployment automation, and uh, watch the result. Ooh, next section is good. How much time? Uh, 25 minutes. Ooh, okay. Better hurry. <clears throat> ah, okay.
Okay. All right. I've got my editor here. I'm gonna I'm gonna change this to. I shouldn't be making a, a change like this to one of my. Uh, uh, let's see. Do I want to make a more minor change? I'm gonna change this to. I'm going to change this to HTTP base in a container. All right? That'll be my new title, or new H1 on the page. So before we had welcome to HTTP base, I'm going to say HTTP base in a container. Um, so I'll commit these changes. Uh, like a good developer, I'll add a commit message. Uh, and like a bad developer, I'll commit directly to the master branch. <laughs> if I was committing to a feature branch, we could definitely, you saw earlier how I can automate based on a, a feature branch. Okay, commit made. Let's go back here and see if we can watch the result. That should automatically trigger, I'm going to reload the screen just in case the WebSocket connection has dropped. Looks like it's likely. <laughs> it worked well for me. Oh, good, good. Yeah, it should be very fast. As soon as you make that commit, um, it's going to make that post across to our service in Amazon. Um, it's not going to re rely on the slow network, so it should be right away um, much faster. My build might be done by the time this page loads. <laughs> Let me know if you see a failed build. In our workshop yesterday, we had a couple failed builds. Um, not all the deploys uh, happen super smooth on Amazon. Um, you know, I often see people, operations teams say that they use Amazon and whole machines just drop out automatically. That's part of uh, how infrastructure as a service, you're supposed to assume that these things are easily destructible. Um, but it's not always uh, convenient when your uh, workshop instances disappear halfway through. We really focus on the platform layer, and so if containers disappear, we'll see that they automatically get replaced. Um, but we're not really dealing with the infrastructure layer. That's really, we consider that to be a different problem to be solved by a different team of people, and it really depends on what infrastructure you have. If you have your own bare metal, you could bring your own bare metal. Um, you can use Amazon. You could use Google Compute. Uh, you've got a variety of choices. And is there a functionality in OpenShift to automatically provision a number of nodes based on load? For example, I can spawn 10 new EC2 instances if I need, and uh, at the same time, if load goes down, I can just migrate the containers uh, to, to, to a few nodes and shut down the rest? Is it that, that, that would be a... Amazon specific integration. Um, I don't know if we have anything to automatically add nodes. That can automatically add a lot of cost uh, if you get your script wrong. Yeah, you can do the same with, with VMware, with, uh, with yeah, anything yeah. else, just to, there are APIs to, to spawn and kill the machines. Yes, we do, we do have uh, auto scaling based on CPU load and memory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not sure if it is in uh, the 3.2 release. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it the, 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 so it can uh, scale the nodes. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, there is automatic scaling. Uh, is, it like is, it? is it present? Even yeah. though I, I used the key to kind of yeah. yeah. the I'm not sure. I should have changed it to my fork. Yeah, yeah, that's, the what, right? that's what you need. You need uh, to, yeah, to yeah, change it your because fork. Because yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if your initial build had, uh, that's that's what you need for your initial build. Yeah? One question. I don't know if it's only in the UI, but I've seen at a certain moment zero pods. So it distracts all the pods and then launches all the pods. It doesn't keep an instance running. There's a, there's a... Running other one down, no? So what we have is, uh, there's that's very configurable. Um, in Kubernetes, there's something called a replication controller that manages the life cycle of the pods. Yes, it is we create one replication controller for each deployment, and then um, we have a variety of strategies for how to migrate the traffic from the first replication controller to the second. So you can do um, 
you know, scale down one as you add one. Um, and I think uh, that should be the default if you have more than one pod. It should be slowly uh, switching it from one replication controller to the next. Uh, there's, but that's very configurable with your deployment config. I am really not having much luck with the network. I tried reconnecting, and it's still um, still having a hard time uh, connecting here. Yeah. Uh, the question is uh, that when you point to some repository, uh -huh. how to tell how to run it actually? Because it's okay for PHP, let's say for JavaScript, but if it requires some special about that, or even for Java, it's not that. If you want um, specific libraries available to PHP or specific C libraries that maybe your application uh, uses, you would bake those into your uh, base image. And so if, if I would make a request to my operations team to say my standard base for PHP needs to have image magic and some uh, crypto libraries and some extra, some extra things like that. I know we have requests to our team uh, you got, give it a try. You got the cable, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna give the the. I'm gonna officially give up on the Wi-Fi for now and try um, try the network again. See if this is. Turn off your Wi-Fi though when you turn on the network. Turn like, actually, like turn off your Wi-Fi card. Oh yeah, I know. Oh. The thing is, when I do, I click on Auto Ethernet here, and it says connection established, but then. Uh, ah, okay, success. Okay, let's see if my if my deployment has happened. By now, I should be well into HTTP base in a container. So this uh, amazingly fast, right? It was a split second after my network connection resumed, it was already deployed. So uh, this should be very easy. Make a change on GitHub, immediately get a new image and a new deployment and you could see your result right away. Share it with your team, share it with your CI environment, right? And rerun the test for the next stage of your pipeline. Good, good tip, thanks Steve. Okay, so, all right, now I'll do really quickly replication and healing with Kubernetes. Hopefully I can move this through this part faster. If the network holds up, I'm gonna add um, some pods here I'm going to say, let's scale this up to six environments. And then I'm going to use the OC command line tool. If I can find a terminal here, I'll do OC login Ooh, against our server URL. I'm using a self-signed certificate, so I'll accept to the... Uh, the additional risk here. I'm going to be user double zero. Password is devconf cz. And I'll take a look at the list of containers. See if I could move this up a bit. Uh, I'll do oc get pods, and we'll see all the containers that we have. I have two. Uh, I have my smoke build and my one smoke environment. I have a dub 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 build, a second build, and uh, all of these have a dash two. These are from my second deployment since I redeployed after the, the uh, rebuild. Uh, I could also run, if I was using the upstream Kubernetes tools, kube control get pods. Let's see if there's any different in, difference in the output. Exact same output, right? We actually pass through to the uh, Kubernetes command line tools for anything that's relevant to Kubernetes. Uh, so now that I have a list of pods, I can actually do, uh, let's intentionally cause some damage to our cluster and see what happens. I'm gonna do OC delete pod, and I'll pick a couple of these guys. This guy, this one, and uh, maybe this unlucky pod. So these three will delete. And let's see how quickly this recovers. It looks like we're still waiting for one to scale up here. But let's see what happens. Either that or the network dropped, one or the other. Uh, still waiting for one. Let's see what happens when we cause some damage 
uh, to the environment. So right away we recognize that there's an error and we reallocate, right? Auto repair our environment immediately. I'm not sure why this one's having some trouble scaling up. Why don't you kill that one? Sorry, what did you do? Find out which one that is and kill yeah, it. Says it's pending. You, you killed it. some pots and uh, uh -huh. Kubernetes. I could also do that from this view here. Let's see, this guy is pending. Let's go in and delete this guy. See if that fixes us up. Okay. <laughs> Something happened, you know. There was there was a reaction. That one was destroyed. Another one got scheduled. So the idea with these replication controllers is you ask for a certain amount, and Kubernetes helps enforce that you always get what you asked for. Um, so Kubernetes is a very early project. It's evolving. Um, I think they're out of beta now, but that's. Uh, you know, we're working really closely with them to help ensure stability of the underlying uh, Kubernetes platform. Uh, and the Docker engine is another thing that uh, we're doing a lot of work uh, looking at ways to make the Docker engine really performant. Um, it's been a challenge sometimes, but um, I think it's a great tool set to start with. I'm not sure if any quote was defined. This project does not have any quotas defined. If I did have quotas defined, I'd be able to click on settings here. Um, and then we should actually see graphs based on my allocation uh, from the operations team. So if the operations team says I get 10 CPU cores and 20 gigs of memory, I should be able to see how much of my quota has been used um, on this page here. And some cloud environment, or only within the existing stack? The quotas, or, or no, the... Generally. You should deploy both... Oh, yeah, anywhere that you have hardware. Yeah, anywhere you have hardware, we can target it using Ansible. Okay, so that was uh, replication and healing. We, we did a scale up earlier. Here's how you would scale from the command line. Uh, here's how you can do a list of a get pods and a delete pod in order to uh, automate or, or to demonstrate that auto recovery. Here's a list of terminology uh, for later. I know this is a lot of terms. It's a lot to think about, especially if you're new to the topic. So I tried to make a, a nice list of uh, follow-up. I know we've covered a lot of this already. Um, but this helps kind of give you a standard idea of what we mean by a node, what we, what we mean by an image. It's not a VM image, it's a container image. Um, what we mean by containers, volumes, pods. Uh, I try to detail all of this so that you would have uh, easy references. And this will link through to our OpenShift documentation so you could learn more about each of these topics. Build configs. Here's a map of some of the pieces that were contributed by Google and some of the pieces that were contributed by the uh, Red Hat team. So Red Hat's really been doing a lot of work to um, make that image notification trigger that will update our deployment config and cause a new replication controller to be created anytime a new image uh, is added to the Docker registry. Uh, we also have from the developer side, anytime the code, source code changes, our build config will fire a, a trigger, build a new image, throw it into our Docker registry, that fires an image change trigger, and then creates a new, and new uh, deploys a new environment there. Any questions about this? No? Makes sense? Uh, yeah. What exactly is meant by deployment? So I have a question about the terminology. Uh, deployment um, team uh, in OpenShift terminology. What do you mean exactly <coughs> by deployment? What we mean specifically by deployment is usually the creation of a new replication controller, um, which manages the the list of pods. So you may deploy a a microservice. Thank you. Uh, it may be usually it's a a single microservice that's being deployed. But a deployment config can also mention uh, multiple images or multiple containers. Yeah. 
and and target a larger deployment. Yeah. So it you had the first version of your application. You click deploy, so you get this running. And yeah, it, and it really is up to it. you. It's up to you to define yeah. what is in the deployment configuration. But this is a object. Uh, let's let's take a look at what I have here. I'll do OC get DC, and the deployment config I want is for dub dub dub. I can choose the output type of JSON, or I could do uh, YAML. I like JSON better, so I'll use that. And we'll take a look at the deployment config. So here's the object type is deployment config. This is a standard Kubernetes object uh, that'll be stored in etcd. We can see every, every Kubernetes object, every single one, they all have a spec and a status. Anytime you request any data from the API, you get two responses. Here is the actual state, and here is the requested state that you've asked for, right? So here's our spec, what we would like to deploy. And at some point, we'll see the status here of what is actually live across the cluster. So if there's a mismatch, um, usually the replication controller corrects for mismatches, and the deployment config only triggers um, when there's a change from the uh, integrated Docker registry. Composition. So I'll do one last example um, where we'll deploy a uh, more complicated application that has multiple, multiple uh, pieces to it, multiple images. There's a couple ways to do uh, composition. I know Docker has a swarm. I like these uh, Kubernetes templates. OpenShift is basically a, a Kubernetes template with support for the new uh, object types that we've added. Deployment config is a new object type that you'll find in an OpenShift template, but maybe not in a Kubernetes template yet, right? Um, if you have an OpenShift template that only has replication controllers and pods, then you should be able to deploy it on any Kubernetes environment. N not just an OpenShift environment, but really any Kubernetes environment should allow you to deploy one of our templates as long as you don't mention one of our special object types, right? One of these advanced object types like a build config, they don't know how to do a build. So, you know, leave that out when you uh, ship things just to Kubernetes, but uh, OpenShift gives you support for additional object types. And for parameterization, right? What's that? I was just wondering, before you go to the next slide, there's a uh, molecule spec there. Yeah, yeah. I don't know very much. Ask the uh, Atomic team about Nulicule. I need something that works today. I use the OpenShift stuff because it's ready right now. And it's based around Kubernetes. They try to have a more open spec that uh, may target a variety of these environments. Um, depends if you need to target multiple platforms. You could look into their spec. I stick with the Kubernetes stuff for now. FC, uh, you were referencing the CoreOS, right? Yeah, yeah, CoreOS is another uh, good spec to look into. Um, this is the main one that you want to know, though. The, the, this is the link to our, our templates. So here's an example app. This is what I'm going to deploy. We could take a look at the source code really quick. Oh, here is the template. Inside this template, you can see there's a list of objects. The first is a service. Right? Standard Kubernetes service. I could deploy this to any Kubernetes environment. Um, there is also, you could see there's some of these strings. Here we're actually going to inject some variables into our template um, before we deploy or before we uh, install it. Uh, you could see one of the containers that I'll be adding is a MongoDB container. This is going to be my database. This one just uses an ephemeral disk, so if I delete MongoDB, no trouble. But this is really just for demo purposes and for maybe for uh, testing my development environment. In my next stage, when I move to staging, I'd have a different template that maybe points me to a larger size database with probably a persistent disk. Okay? Uh, so we could see there we're going to inject the database password. 
uh, the database uh, name and a variety of other uh, details. We're also going to pass these same credentials into our front end environment so it knows how to authenticate against our database. Where, where would those be filled from, filled in, kind of like where, where, where are they stored? You so within they're stored in etcd okay. in our, in our uh, build config or our deployment config. Um, here, this is the template before it's actually executed, and what you can see at the end of the tip, or somewhere in this template, we'll see a list of parameters. These are going to be automatically injected in. Some of these will predefine a default value, and some of these um, will s you use an expression to generate. So I could have, uh, for every user in this class, we could say, I want you to start with the name user, and then have a... Uh, zero through nine and uh, you know three numbers and we could generate users zero through a hundred and nine 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 so you know something like that uh, if we wanted to give it a specific range I should probably have more than three characters here but you could see how it's very easy to generate a semi-random username and a password here we've got a little bit more characters 16 characters for our password a little bit more secure but we could bump this up if we need to right Maybe in our production stage, we use uh, 100 characters. I don't know. Uh, uh, so there, that's, that's the basics. I'm going to take this uh, template file. I'm going to do OC uh, create dash F uh, and I have a local copy of this template. I'm going to install the template. This will make it available. Thank you. This will make it available uh, internally within OpenShift. So let's take a look at that. This allows me to really make easy one-click installers <coughs> for, you don't even need to be a developer. This could really be anyone within my organization. I want them to sp spin up a, or deploy a specific solution. And now we have a way to iterate on those solutions and maintain those solutions. So I'll do add to project. And here we see in the list of databases, uh, is it in this list? Aha, uh -huh, here is my new installer here. Restify, this is a Node.js web service. We're using MongoDB and we'll uh, show a map with some data on it. So I'll click on this. We'll go right into this workflow that allows us to customize the source repository. Sorry, it's uh, hard to read here. It's because of the screen resolution is a little. If you, if, you, if you want to make it a font smaller, you, I, the old guy in the back can still see it. There you go. I can still see okay, it. Okay, here. Now you, you, can go can. More, you can go more if you want. Yeah, you okay. See. I'm a good judge for not being able to see. Uh, okay. There you go. Oh, hey, thanks. All right. Uh, we could we could change the web service name. Um, we can I'm going to let it automatically generate the database username and password. I think we have good defaults in our template. Um, and I'm almost out of time, so I'm just going to hit create, and we'll see if we could launch the whole template. It says application created. We've got some information on how people can follow up and log in from the command line. I'll go back to my overview page. We could see already MongoDB is being provisioned. It's being, uh, here we go, scaling up. We got our MongoDB available. The build is running for our front end web service. The route has already been defined. We could take a look at this uh, log and watch the build, but since I'm low on time, I'm going to I'm going to go through the last bit of my slides and then, and then hop back and hopefully we'll have a big reveal of uh, the resulting app. So, ways to try OpenShift. Uh, of course, we'd love to have your money, right? Uh, sign up for OpenShift Enterprise, OpenShift Dedicated. If you want us to be your operations team, you can have the, the, the guys at Red Hat actually adminning your project with OpenShift Dedicated. In Dedicated, we set up a pretty good sized cluster. I think it's 10 machines or so. Um, the upstream releases are available on OpenShift Origin releases. This is where you got the CLI tool. Um, we also have an all-in-one VM if you want to run the whole thing on your laptop. 
we have a VirtualBox file and a Vagrant, a VirtualBox image and a Vagrant file. So you can really follow these instructions and just run Vagrant up and you'll get the whole cluster all in a single machine on your laptop. This is great for developers to experiment or a way to demo this environment for other people. You won't be able to do webhooks here since it can't call you back at, at localhost. Um, but it's a great way to demo all the rest of the pieces. Um, you could also build your own cluster using OpenShift Ansible. I set one up this morning. It took me about 20 minutes to provision a group of 10 machines. Um, this is an example of the command I used. If you want to do specifically OpenShift Enterprise and Amazon, um, you want this, this repo here instead. This is some uh, experimental stuff we'll be merging back down into OpenShift Ansible very soon. Um, if you have specific questions about this, feel free to reach out. I'm Ryan J. I'd be happy to help. We also have some free ebooks for you guys. If you want to learn more about Kubernetes, click on this link. We got a free O'Reilly book, another free O'Reilly book about uh, use about Docker security, um, the OpenShift docs. Uh, Diane here from the OpenShift Commons effort uh, is a great resource if you have a company who likes to uh, communicate, be involved in the conversation. At Red Hat we really believe uh, open source is, is about being involved in a conversation about technology. Uh, that's why it needs to be open. If I have to uh, uh, agree to a non-disclosure agreement, I'm cutting myself out of the conversation. Right? So bring your company into the OpenShift Commons, participate, give us some feedback. We're not going to ask you to sign an NDA. We're not even going to ask you for money. Uh, it's a very open, uh, great way to participate. We also have some official training courses from Red Hat um, and some extra white papers and customer references if you need to convince your boss. So I'm out of time. I'm going to go back and let's see if our, if our build has finished and if my environment has deployed. Ah, oh, it still says it's... Uh, Ah, oh, 503. Uh, well, I think you guys got the basic idea. And uh, you should be able to deploy a whole map uh, mapping application really that easy. Any follow-up questions on any of this? Yeah. Yeah, uh, if I want to deploy an application written in Go, which mm -hmm. doesn't really depend on stuff, is there like a, just a bare uh, thing to deploy in? Application written in Go. Um, so he's asking, I think he's asking if there's like a straight up Docker image that he can just drop a binary in and have yeah, it run. Exactly. Is that right? Yeah, exactly because the Go app just has everything in it. Yeah, I, I don't know. We don't have any builder images, any base images for adding your Go repo code on top of a known base. Okay. Um, but if, if you're interested in contributing a, a source to image, um, uh, Yakov locally has some information. Yeah? So we don't have any base images for Go, we could actually take one of the base images that we, on top of which we build the, uh, all the uh, current language images and have a look at how we build the builders for either Ruby, Python, Node or others. And looking at that, build your own builder. Right, I'm going to to it's, it's not that hard. Yeah, yeah, no there are problem. Sure. Of okay, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm out of here. Um, you know, the slides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. There's no requirement to use our builder. If you have any more questions, I got to get out of here. Uh, meet us at the the OpenShift booth in the main area. We'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, guys. Thank you.